Hey everybody, how's it going? I hope you all had a lovely New Year's Eve. Uh, I am not hungover, in spite of what several of you have accused me of, because I have a giant water bottle. And one thing I suggest is if you are ever going to go drinking, that whatever amount of liquor you drink, you drink two to three times that in water, and have a gigantic water bottle that you carry with you at all times. I woke up at 9.30 this morning, refreshed and ready to go. So what I'd like to do today is just kind of give you an update on everything that has been going on with regards to Right to Repair, and what Repair Preservation Group and Repair Preservation Group Action Fund have been doing. There are certain things that I can make public and certain things that I cannot make public. Again, many of these companies have the benefit of tens of hundreds of millions of dollars, and I have the eight to 900,000 that I raised. And thank you. Thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to do something. But I don't, I'd rather not allow others to get ahead of the, some of the work that we're doing by announcing everything immediately. So um, a couple of pieces of news here is that in California, a senator announced that they will be reintroducing a right to repair bill. In Florida, you have a senator that is filing an agricultural repair bill, which is pretty cool. I do not have any involvement in the state of Florida, but it is most certainly something that I would look into. A win for agricultural right to repair, even though it does not affect my business in any way, shape, or form, is still a win and a step forward, and I am happy to help facilitate that happening. We have in Hawaii, we have House Bill 415, 226, Senate Bill 760, and 564. These are bills that were filed last session, and I'm hoping that they don't say that they'll have a hearing on it in 2050, like the last one. In Illinois, we have House Bill 3061. It is a carryover, and I am hoping to make some progress there, and I am open to doing some work lobbying in Illinois. We've been feeling out and dealing with some lobbyists there. In Massachusetts, there is House Bill 341 and Senate Bill 166. These are awaiting committee action. This is going to be important because there is a deadline for this to clear the committee on February 2nd. So if you are in Massachusetts and you do care about right to repair, it would be great if you could push your politicians prior to that February 2nd deadline, because if nothing happens by February 2nd, it dies. I don't have lobbyists in Massachusetts. However, repair.org has retained a lobbyist in Massachusetts. In Oklahoma, this is kind of funny. So they, somebody actually wrote an op-ed that was, you know, kind of shitting on U.S. Perg for their work trying to move forward medical right to repair. This is something I've discussed on this channel to some extent in some prior videos with medical right to repair. Pair. The absolute TLDR of that is you ever see those um, yeah you ever see those operating tables that they have where you know you, you're like laying down or just a table in the hospital that you lay down on like this and there's like a little motor that you could use a little button that allows it to kind of recline or go like this when that $500 motor dies they're not able to get a replacement motor because the company that makes the motor is not allowed to sell it to them because that the manufacturer told them not to. They were forced to replace the entire operating table when that thing costs about thirty to $36,000. There are many instances like this, whether we're talking about endoscope repair, which I went over in this video a while back. Damn you and your ads. Ah! Anyway, yeah, the, how right to repair affects healthcare costs, hospital, and the medical industry. I can't believe I'm cursing my own ads. It's total karma. But, uh, you know, I went over this in some past videos, and I've also went over it in an interview that I did with somebody who actually does medical device repair. And one of the things that I found interesting is they're, act, you know, they're starting to feel a little bit threatened by it. They're understanding that people are noticing that part of the reason that healthcare is so expensive is because they, instead of being able to do a $500 to $1,000 repair, they force you to replace a $36,000 device, and this is rampant throughout the medical device repair industry. If you watch the videos in this channel and you think some of the stuff that I talk about with Apple is egregious, where they're charging people $2,000 when there's a bent pin, my God, like d don't go and don't even start digging into healthcare. You'll, you'll just become incredibly and uncontrollably angry, and rightfully so. So there's this one piece in the Oklahoman, it was written by an ex politician. Right to repair increases patient and cybersecurity risks. The entire piece does never not go over once how it increases cybersecurity risks. What I found particularly interesting is that he starts citing a, a report from the FDA from 2018 that I'd like to go over with you. He's fear-mongering and saying that they reported that they don't even know how many independent service organizations are repairing medical devices, estimating up to 21,000 companies could be fixing these pieces of equipment. He said in that same 2018 report, there were 4,301 documented cases of situations where patients were at risk due to faulty and unregulated third-party service. Now, if you actually look over the report, which I went over on this channel when it came out in 2018, I figured, you know, you might as well read the source material. So I figured I would read this. And I do hope that people in Oklahoma are able to see through this. And Don Williams, if he's watching, he's one of the people who actually emails me from time to time and actually goes to the legislature and speaks to his representatives. He also he sends me cool letters every now and then. If we take a look at this report, and I will include a link down below, FDA report on the safety 
quality, and effectiveness of servicing medical devices, let's just go over to the executive summary on page one. Executive summary, page one. The current available objective evidence is not sufficient to conclude whether or not there is a widespread public health concern related to servicing, including by third-party services, of medical devices that would justify imposing additional or different burdensome regulatory requirements at this time. Rather, the objective evidence indicates that many OEMs and third-party and entities provide high-quality, safe, and effective servicing of medical devices. A majority of the comments, complaints, and adverse effects reports alleging that inadequate servicing caused or contributed to clinical adverse effects and deaths actually pertain to remanufacturing and not servicing. And the continued availability of third-party entities to service and repair medical devices is critical to the functioning of the U.S. healthcare system. That is not coming from me. That is not coming from some biased right-to-repair person. That is coming straight from FDA.gov. So this individual wrote a two- or three-page fear-mongering report on how right-to-repair is going to be bad for the medical device industry. It's going to be bad. You shouldn't have these people fixing things. When any cites an FDA report, and he is so sure that people are not even going to bother to check the source material, that he cites a report that on page one says that the continued availability of third-party entities to service and repair medical devices is critical to the functioning of the United States healthcare system. I do not have any involvement in Oklahoma, but again, I am open to tossing my hat in the ring and providing them with a little bit of support, whether it is lobbying or grassroots organizing or anything else. Again, medical device repair does not affect my business personally. I do not fix medical devices. I fix MacBooks, but a win for medical device right to repair is a win for right to repair in general and is a step in the right direction. Once right to repair passed in Massachusetts in 2012 and 2020, and people realized, wait a second, you mean cars are not just going Skynet and like driving into people and exploding in the middle of the road because you let people fix their own cars? It kind of gets it into the psyche that all the fear mongering was bullshit. So the more right to repair can pass in areas that have nothing to do with me, and once it passes, once people can see, wait a second, you mean the world is not ending because people are allowed to service their own products? Oh, wow. You guys are full of shit. If I couldn't trust you guys on cars or medical equipment, maybe I shouldn't trust you when you were wrong about consumer electronics right to repair too. So I am more than happy to toss my hat in the ring in some of these areas and uh, go over that. And if you ever want an update on what we're up to, uh, you know, anytime we wind up hiring lobbyists or stuff like that, I do post it to fighttorepair.org. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm not really a, a great person when it comes to web design or any of that shit. I'm, I use YouTube as my medium. But if you just go to fighttorepair.org, you can click on blog. <clears throat> you can click on blog. There we go. And you can click on see more posts and you can get an idea of what we're doing. So if we hire a particular lobbying firm, if I, you know, we hire somebody to post to the wiki, uh, you know, all that. If, if uh, Oreo jumps in my lap while I'm doing the video and steps on my trackball, <clears throat> uh, you know, I, I will I will keep you all updated on this stuff. I'm very excited to see what the new year brings. And as always, I am infinitely humbled, grateful and honored by every single one of you that donated to help with these efforts. Uh, the you know again even the people that gave 20 or 30 cents literally a every last one of it is incredibly appreciated and I will be sticking to the promise that I made to you in the very beginning which is that I will be putting in a best effort even you know can't, I can't guarantee I'll succeed but I will put in a best effort to get this pushed forward I will put in a best effort to inform you and when I'm not able to tell you exactly what I'm doing at the time because I don't want it to ruin ongoing investigations or work I will make sure to let you know later on and as I said, I'm not paying myself a salary from either of these organizations, which will come out when the Form 990s come out. There's an older video I did on this channel where I went over the bank statements of both nonprofits. And what you will see from that is I am sticking to my word of drawing a salary of zero. There have been detractors that have been saying, you're getting paid off of this. I can't believe these idiots are, get, are actually donating to these nonprofits so that you can do lobbying, that they realize you're... I'm giving myself a salary of zero dollars from it. I'm doing this because it's something I believe in. I'm, you know, there's this... There's this thing when it comes to advocacy work where if if you're getting paid to try and quote fix a problem and you stop getting paid once the problem is solved then there's this innate conflict of interest present and i'm gonna get some shit for this but there's this innate conflict of interest that i want to avoid where you're kind of incentivized to never fix the problem because you stop getting paid once you fix the problem and i really would like to be as far away from that as is humanly possible uh you know 
this is something that I believe in, and it's something that I hope to be able to make a lot more progress with in the new year than I have in the past. And I, I know I'm awkward and I repeat myself when saying thank you and that I appreciate it. I'm not really good at showing appreciation or saying thank you. It winds up just being me repeating myself over and over again. But truly, from the bottom of my heart and from Oreos, thank you very much for allowing me to help advocate for the ability to repair your own property. That's it for today. And as always, I hope you learned something. And uh, yeah, just always check your source material. I think that's really important because we live in a world nowadays, and you see this a lot with millennial journalism. Admittedly, this is not millennial journalism. This gentleman is over twice my age, but you'll see it where they have an article and they'll have a lot of links in the article. And they just assume that if, if I just bombard you with citations that you won't actually check them. And this article in the Oklahoman, it literally cites a report from the FDA that if you simply click on page one, talks about how third-party entities are critical to the functioning of our healthcare system. And they're, again, they're assuming that you're never going to check any of the primary sources. When they say, the FDA said this in 2018, what about the rest of what they said? Of course, you're not paying attention to that because it goes against your particular interests and your particular narrative. That's it for today. I'll see you in the next video. Uh, thank you so much to, again, sorry I keep repeating myself, but I'm just very, very grateful. I really... I really had no idea that when I did run that fundraiser that over $800,000 would come pouring in to help me lobby on behalf of this, and I am, I am very grateful for it. See you in the next video.